Welcome to today's webinar. We are really delighted to be sharing about the most recent archaeology that's been happening on site with the fantastic team, um, Historic England, uh, led by project manager Thomas Cromwell. But this is all part of uh, Marble Hill's revival. Marble Hill's revival will see the house open for five days a week for free. It will see the landscape being invested in, much of which you can see in situ now. Um, we have a fantastic little play area, a wonderful new cafe that has been brought into house. So every time you have a cup of coffee, you know that that money is going back to the charity. And also we've got a raft of events. So um, just a few little bits of housekeeping, just to say that you uh, will be on mute for the duration of the talk. Please do ask uh, Thomas lots of questions. And you can do that by going to the chat function that is in the, at the bottom of your screen. And it looks like a little speech bubble. I'm sure that you are all Zoom professionals by now. Um, but just so you know, that's the best way to contact um, uh, and ask questions. And I will do my best to post these at the end of Thomas's talk. We are uh, really delighted to welcome Thomas. This is the third uh, of his talks and the fourth of the Historic England's talk, talks about archaeology at Marble Hill. Um, he's delighted us with information about the bowling alley, about the landscape and um, about the ice house seat, all of which is available on the YouTube channel. Um, so do please check that out. Um, and also we've had Judith Dobie talking about illustrating archaeology, so all of that is available. Um, but we've been really delighted to have the team with us for the past month to explore a bit more about our grotto on site. So I'm not going to take uh, steal any of Thomas's thunder, um, but it is such a delight to have him back here this evening to talk to us about Marble Hills Grotto. Thomas. Right, so my name is Tom. I'm an archaeologist with Historic England, and I've been involved in the Marble Hill project for some years now, um, near enough since the start of it. And we're, we're happy to be working with English Heritage uh, to provide expert archaeological advice and archaeological field work as part of their project to bring Marble Hill back to life. Uh, and it's been good fun so far. We've looked at a number of features in the landscape, and I've given several talks already on the subject. Um, and of course, all of this is made possible courtesy of um, the lottery money that has been secured as a grant um, from the, let me get this right, National Lottery Heritage Fund, people who used to be known as the Heritage Lottery Fund until uh, a name change a year ago. So we've been involved quite heavily and if we start for, for those who may not be familiar with the site, because I don't know who's out there watching this at the moment and who might be watching on, on the recorded versions later on, this is uh, an air photo of Marble Hill Park. And it is pretty much the outline of the land owned by Lady Henrietta Howard, the um, Countess of Suffolk uh, in the 18th century. The, the house is in the middle, and the area we're interested, the grotto, is down here where the star is on the map. Just to give you an idea, roughly halfway down the lawn between the house and the river. Um, all right, so the grotto, for those of you who know the site, looked like this up until just before Christmas. Um, it is covered in, in hedges. And you take a walk around it and then down into the grotto itself. There were steps down that lead, led to this um, stonework archway. And all of this was essentially the work of the Greater London Council in the late 1980s. Uh, and we know that because we have the drawings. They still survive in the archives uh, with all sorts of various schemes for rebuilding the grotto. Now, um, one of the reasons it doesn't look like that anymore is that in order to do our work, we had to remove the vegetation and we had to do so in the winter season to avoid the nesting birds who otherwise would have moved back in in the spring and we didn't want to disturb them. So we thought it best to remove the vegetation sort of a bit early, sort of in, in December of last year, even though we weren't going to be on site until August. Uh, it was much better than risking disturbing birds that were nesting freshly in, in the site. So, um, right. 
The interesting part about this grotto is that apparently it had disappeared from common knowledge in the early 20th century. Uh, and it was rediscovered in 1941 when uh, there's a large tree fall at, uh, to the right of this picture. And a man from the ministry is standing at the edge of it, looking down into the broken vault over the chamber of the grotto, the actual brick room that's underground uh, that you'd have seen through that archway we saw a moment ago. Uh, and he's got his briefcase behind him and it all looks so, so typically 1940s. Um, apparently once it had been discovered by this tree falling in, they infilled the whole lot with soil. So it wasn't originally actually backfilled properly, but it had been made to disappear by about the turn of the 20th century. And you'll notice as well that this drawing calls it an ice house rather than a grotto, uh, a bit of confusion on the part of whoever labeled the, the photograph. Um, but the grotto was rediscovered twice, having disappeared originally. Uh, the second time was in 1984 when the infill into this hole started subsiding. And a team from the Greater London Council, working with Richmond Archaeology Society, excavated within the chamber that um, the ministry had filled up so lovingly 40 years earlier. And um, unfortunately for us, oh, out of sequence there, uh, we know that they recorded it, but the records that they drew and, and wrote for this site seem to have disappeared somewhere in the archives. Uh, so we're hoping to get our hands on them at some point in the, in the future. But more importantly with the grotto, we'd always known it was there, well, at least in the last handful of years, because they discovered a drawing hidden in the Norfolk um, Record Office, I believe, that had been drawn by the surveyor to the Duke of Argyle, as, as uh, we know from the cartouche in the top right hand of this map. And it dates to somewhere around 1750. Uh, there are debates as to whether it was 1748, 1749, as late as 1752. Uh, all of that is unimportant to our need, which is to understand that there is a map and it shows landscape features and we can then look for them. There's a key on the left-hand side that tells us where the grotto is. And if we zoom in on the, the detailed part in the bottom there, which is the formal gardens, um, we've got the house at the top and down on the right-hand side, we have the grotto area. And if we zoom in again on that, uh, we can see some detail. It's a, it's a bit pixelated, unfortunately, the copy that I've got. Um, so we, yeah, we could do with taking a, a fresh copy um, close up probably. However, what we can see here is where there's a letter E on the map on the left-hand side in front of a little archway, that is the entrance to the grotto as far as we're aware. The, the brick chamber that we discovered in 1941 and 1984. And it sits within some sort of outer sort of courtyard. So we have the grotto here, and then we have the depression for the grotto, something that I'm calling the grotto bowl as opposed to the grotto chamber. And it's a large shape, and it's roughly sort of guitar pick shaped, if you, if you look at it that way, sort of like a plectrum. And it seems to have a round, um, pathway in the bottom of it with lots of little um, almost Christmas trees drawn on it on the map, which is interesting because um, it's a lot of detail for this particular feature. And uh, if we look at another drawing, an early plan for the gardens um, attributed variously to uh, Charles Bridgman and Alexander Pope, who both were involved heavily with designing the garden for Henrietta Howard. Um, we can see down the bottom right, the area where our grotto should be. If we zoom in on that, um, we've got something that's called a mount. So where it says flowering shrubs, and then it has a mount there. So it looks like the initial plan didn't actually have a grotto of any sort. We know Pope was big on grottos. It was his passion in the, the 1730s. And um, he had quite a lot of influence on the garden and how Henrietta Howard should, should lay things out. So it's not surprising that we do wind up with a grotto. He had a spectacular one under his house. And there are grottos at places like Chiswick, uh, Paynes Hill Park. The, they, they became the thing to have in the early to mid 18th century in your formal garden. All right, so armed with the knowledge 
that the grotto was much bigger than what had been sculpted in the 1980s by the Greater London Council, we set out to, to find out how big it might have been um, in uh, 2017. We had two episodes of excavation that left us a series of trenches shown in green on this particular plan, uh, which is just laid over the contours. We knew where to look because, of course, we had the grotto actually in the ground. So we knew we knew where the feature had to be. And we dug a series of trenches around it because at that point it was still surrounded by hedges and therefore we couldn't get any closer to it. But we found evidence of it in pretty much all of our trenching. And it's roughly in the right sort of size and shape to match what we saw earlier as a sort of guitar pick shaped depression in the ground. So armed with that knowledge, um, English Heritage decided that it would be a good thing to excavate the grotto out and then to look at perhaps restoring it to its full glory, to the full size of the feature that was there, re reinstating the landscaping in the same way that they've been doing the same sort of work in the various areas of the woodland quarters. They've rebuilt the Nine Pin Alley, for example. Um, so the grotto would be one more 18th century ornamental feature brought back to life based on the 1750 drawing. Okay, so um, after the, well, before we get to what we're doing now, these are the trenches from 2017. This trench is directly opposite the entrance, directly opposite the steps down into the grotto there where it says, just above where it says Harris Fence on the right-hand side of this drawing. So if I go back to it, uh, we had basically a corner of the grotto bowl showing in this. And you can see at the bottom of of the, the trench, there's a yellowy sand, above which is a very dark layer of what we now know to be sort of an ashy deposit, and some brick above that, which is a very light colored deposit. The stick standing upright in the trench is one meter tall, to give you an idea of scale. Um, and we now know that the ash deposit and the brick above it are fairly late intrusions into the, the, the sequence. But more importantly, down at the bottom next to the stick, and if we look at them from above, we had two circular features that we were a bit puzzled by, but we thought, could it possibly be some sort of planting pits? So these features here, um, and we'll come back to that subject in a minute, but we were, we were quite intrigued with the idea that we had the, the eastern edge of the grotto and it seemed to have some sort of features left in it, which is good. Um, around the north side, we had a large trench and the important thing is, in the distance here, circled in red, we can see once again the edge of the grotto showing through as a dark sort of feature there. So that's the transition from um, the, the natural brick earths and gravels in the foreground of the picture and the infill of the old grotto heading off into the distance. Okay, so we decided this year we were going to open up a large area and essentially chase the limits of the grotto. This is us beginning to do so on the south side of the steps, um, coming down. Um, and if we look at the north side, where my colleague Kevin is uh, busy supervising the machining that was going on, uh, just behind the machine at the top is the woodland quarter. So looking north up towards the house. And the important, the important parts of this particular photo are that um, running roughly diagonally from sort of top left to bottom right, you can see a darkish stripe across this, this image of soil, about a foot thick in places. This is the same ashy deposit that we saw in the other trench from 2017. And above it, there's quite a large layer of brick, and it's mostly modern brick. Um, round about the turn of the century, we have bricks that are frogged LBC for the London Brick Company, that we know was incorporated about 1880, but that didn't seem to be putting that mark on their bricks till closer to 1900, and other bricks um, of similar vintage. And if the bricks are being made about 1900 and are being built into some sort of building and then demolished because they have mortar on them, so they've obviously been used in a building, then they can't really have wound up in here until probably maybe the 1920s, 1930s, depending on how long the building they were made into had as a lifespan. And the soil underneath Kevin's boots, the orangey material, is an earlier backfilling of the grotto. Um, 
I think that the, the demolition of the grotto is actually in multiple phases. So here's some of the bricks that we found. You can see on the right, there's the one with LBC. Uh, on the left, underneath the ruler is one that says Ingham. There are a number of other um, identifiable makes. And some of this has very much a look of some sort of public building, especially the Ingham brick, which is glazed on the outside and curved. These are the sorts of things you find in doorways leading into public conveniences and other sort of municipal buildings that had to be fairly hard wearing. And it, it, it shouts turn of the century, uh, which implies if it's, if it's a turn of the century building, it's not being demolished till probably after World War I, which means the hole into which all these bricks have been deposited has to have been open at least into the period after World War I. Um, unlike the, the received wisdom that we had at the start of the project that the entire thing had been backfilled and leveled off by 1900. Um, and round the back of the grotto, um, the Greater London Council had a problem because, of course, the brick chamber of the grotto had a broken arch. So when they emptied it out in the 1980s, they had to do something about it. And we've got this lovely reinforced concrete roof that they put over the top. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it's, uh, it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Right. So inside the grotto, this is the state we found it in when we started it a month ago. This is looking at the south wall. There's a large hole caused by I don't know what, and something's obviously been burrowing into it, and the sand is pouring out into the, into the, the grotto itself. And when we cleaned out the inside, uh, this is us partway through cleaning the floor, um, you can see on the walls, uh, there certainly to the, the middle panel and the panel to the left, there are lots of small circular marks on it, which are essentially mortar impressions of shells that we use to decorate the inside. Now to the right hand side in the corner, it all looks a bit less clear. And that's because they've applied something that we call rustication, which means essentially they've taken the, the stark corner of brickwork and they filled it in with bits of rock and bits of coral and bits of flint, basically anything that would make it look pretty and interesting and irregular, kind of like the inside of a cave. And the idea was to mimic these sort of mythical caves of, of sort of Greek and Roman mythology, uh, the sort of thing that people in the early 17, 1700s were actually seeing on the grand tour and bringing that knowledge back to the UK. So we've got also on the floor, you can start to see the pebble flooring uh, being exposed. We knew it was there from the photos in the 1980s. And we were very pleased to find that it's actually still there. And this is looking at the north wall by comparison. Again, we've got the pebble floor that we've started to expose. Um, and again, at the, the left hand side, you can see that the round impressions of shells where they've been glued onto the wall effectively with little dabs of mortar behind them. The shells themselves tend to pop off. They don't last forever. Uh, this is a known problem in grottos in places like Italy where they've used shell decoration and every so often you have to go and stick the things back on. Um, and you can see the top of the arch that collapsed in 1941. And then above that, um, this brick with a very yellowy mortar, which is the GLC building everything up to a level before they put the roof on it. Okay, this is the back wall. Um, so this is looking in through the, the entrance archway. Um, and you can see that bright yellow mortar of the GLC brick at the top and the, the concrete slab over the roof of it. So all of that is, is new work effectively. And then this is looking out through the front um, into a foyer area. There's, there's a, a curious cone of bricks on the floor. We don't know the ins and outs of it. It appears to be um, a couple of phases of construction with slightly different bricks and slightly different mortar, the bottom three courses being earlier than the rest. But it's certainly there by the time the GLC are fiddling with it. Um, and it seems to cap a sort of sump or well. So if we look up in the ceiling, we've got the skylight that we saw the outside of on the concrete slab um, to allow some light in. And the idea was the slab itself would be buried under about a foot of soil with just the skylight exposed so that we can get light inside. Um, and then looking at the floor, uh, the first thing to notice is a big well in the middle of it, another sump effectively 
connected by a pipe to the, the, the one outside. So we're looking at some sort of water management. We excavated it down to about one and a half meters, at which point the water table came up to find us. So we've had to stop. All the way down though, that sump has been full of a mix of interesting material, big lumps of coral about the size of a dinner plate, um, and flints and other materials, the occasional conch shell, which are coming in from the Caribbean. And then it's also full of modern coins, uh, tennis balls that dogs have lost. And even down near the bottom, we were still getting packets from quavers with use by dates of 1989. So clearly the well had been emptied as part of the 1980s work. And then it was backfilled by the workmen after the archeologists had gone away and they were getting rid of things that we probably would have wanted to keep instead, such as the big lumps of coral. Um, and if you look at the floor itself, there are all sorts of patterns going on. Um, and on the left-hand side with the arrows pointing, we've got cattle leg bones being used as a decorative edging on the floor. This is another common sort of 18th century tradition for garden structures that to use either cattle or sheep or um, deer bones as a decorative function within sort of outdoor or sort of you know, garden building floors. So we've got these lovely panels of flints where they've obviously broken flints in half and stuck them broken side up. So you get this nice dark bluey gray um, color to them interspersed with panels of pebbles. And these are sort of water-worn um, pebbles that we don't have any around here, but they're probably coming from not terribly far away. Whereas the flints are coming from a much longer distance. They're, they're not natural to this area at all. Um, and most of the floor, unfortunately, um, is just patches of mortar um, substrate where the floor itself has come off. Um, and at some point, probably in the 19th century, they sunk the, the well into the floor as part of a change of function of the grotto from somewhere that you went into and sat in to somewhere that you looked at from the outside, because obviously there's a big hole in the floor now. Um, all right, so here's some of the materials that we were getting out. At the back, those dark lumps on the table are lumps of brain coral, so-called because it, it has twisty surface patterns that look kind of like an animal brain. Um, and they're coming from the Caribbean along with the shells that we're getting um, the various sort of conches and stuff. We've also got um, furnish, nah, furnace waste, which is essentially where they make glass. Uh, they, they heat up a crucible full of, of sand and other ingredients, turn it into a liquid, and then they can you know, take that out to do glass blowing. The, the actual crucibles don't last that long in the furnace a few weeks to a month maybe before the heat gets to them, they break and they have to be taken out and replaced with another one. And of course, a glass works in full flow. It's gonna generate lots of this stuff as debris. So it's the glass that was left in the pot, um, stuff that's melted over the sides, broken bits of crucible, things that they would normally throw out. But of course, in the 18th century, they suddenly found a market for them. Um, people who were building grottos wanted to buy this stuff because if you polish it up, the glass itself, it's shiny, it reflects light. It can be quite decorative. And these were the sorts of things that they were sticking to the walls inside the grotto to create that mystical cave effect. Right, outside the grotto, um, this is just north of the entranceway, which is in the background, the sort of top left of the photo. And what we saw on the right-hand side, that yellowy material is the natural sand. And we have the profile of the backfill of the grotto coming down the various steps that we cut with the machine um, into the, the hole. And you can see we've dug a slot across uh, a deposit of brick rubble. And that rubble is very good for 18th century. It's, it's all early brick. Uh, it's got lots of uh, flints. We've had the odd bit of coral out of it and even the odd shell. Yes, you know, sort a of conch shell type things. That are being imported. And it sits in a, in a cut that kind of slopes down to the left. So if you look at the, uh, the red and white ranging rod that's laying on the right hand side, about halfway along that rod you can see that the, the sand dives down under this rubble. 
And that's an actual feature of how they built the grotto in the first place, sort of digging the hole down and terracing it because that semicircular thing that you can see at the right hand side, and let me just, um, okay, so that's the rubble. Um, down here, we have some cobbles that I'll get to in a moment, but that arrow there is pointing to a, a circular pit. We've taken half of it out, so it's only semicircular in, in this photo, uh, but essentially it's a planting pit. So um, this shows us where they were putting in the ornamental shrubs and trees and things that we saw in the 1750 plan. And it's on a sort of terrace in the sand before you dive down to where the cobbles are where the blue arrow is. And just below the blue arrow and not visible in this photo, unfortunately, is another planting pit. And the interesting thing about that is we look at it from another angle. So this is looking north effectively, sort of standing on the, the steps down in, into the front of the grotto sort of foyer space. Uh, we've got that cobbled surface in the middle of the photo where the, the little red and white um, scale is, is sitting. And we've got those, those cobbles and then just behind them, unfortunately not visible because it's been trampled under the sand, just, just to the edge of that is a planting pit. And then we have the other one that we saw uh, up on the terrace right at the top left corner of the photo. So these correspond, if we look at the 1750, to roughly that area. And you can see it's got a circular path that runs around both the north and south sides of the middle of the grotto, which I think is the cobbles that we saw. And we've got these plantings. So we can actually now tie the 1750 plan directly to exact features in the ground. And I think we're heading toward being able to use this as a blueprint to reconstruct the grotto. Uh, we found a number of other planting pits in the right places that suggest that this is genuine recorded detail of a feature that existed at the time. Okay, so these are our planting pits here. Um, all right, and um, on a completely different change, I mean, something I don't have a slide of because we were only doing the work today, we brought in another machine and we started digging to the south of that red circle on the other side of the steps that we've left in. And we found a bit more cobble and we found another planting pit. So we're actually seeing this plan sort of springing to life in the soil. Right, so around the back of the grotto, we have that concrete slab that I mentioned earlier. And we found a, a, a set of brick walls because we, we wanted to see how the slab was built. So we wanted to look at the, the construction cut for it. And in doing so, we came across the brick that you see here. So we emptied quite a bit of it out to see what's going on. And it's actually more confusing than we thought because originally I saw that and I thought, ooh, this will be a brick chamber behind the panel in the middle of the back wall of the grotto, implying that that panel's in a, a later blocking of an earlier chamber. Unfortunately, it turns out that this is a separate structure, completely different, completely unattached to the actual grotto construction. And it's got a tile floor that would be about two thirds of the way up the inside wall of the grotto. So it isn't actually going down enough to be a, a chamber on the inside. It's a completely different thing. Again, it is gone by the early to mid 19th, uh, 20th century. And it does look like it's somehow involved in some sort of water management or waste management. We're not really sure what it's about, but unfortunately, without breaking up the concrete slab, we won't be able to see how it relates directly to the grotto uh, brickwork because that's underneath that concrete that's never going anywhere anytime soon. But um, if anyone has any thoughts, I'd be more than happy to hear them. There's no evidence that I've seen of any structures there uh, by the time the, the Ordnance Survey is mapping the area and so on. So we have no idea what this is, but someone has clearly built a chamber that you can only access from above. And it's the right sort of size and shape probably for a, for a decent um, soak away for a, um, essentially a latrine. But why it's there, we have no idea. Right, and just to show that it does have actually a drain in the corner of it. So it's clearly meant to have held some liquids and then allowed them to escape. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a strange feature, this one. Right, 
Now, I mentioned earlier on that um, we felt the, the bowl of the grotto was probably left open fairly late. This plan, dated 1906, shows exactly that sort of feature. It's a large open hollow. It's where the grotto should be, but we have none of the detail of the grotto. We don't have our circular path around the bottom of it. Um, we don't have our rows of, of ornamental planting, planting rather, and our paths that lead in and out. And we also don't have the grotto chamber showing on the left-hand side of it. It's just basically a big depression in the lawn. And I reckon, because this plan is effectively a tracing over of the 1896 Ordnance Survey map, I reckon this is something to do with either the Cunard family who took over the site at the end of the 19th century with the idea of knocking down the house and developing the whole thing into a housing estate. So it's either to do with them or probably to do with the council that bought the site in 1902 to save it as a public park for the, for the area. And that as part of that, they augmented the Ordnance Survey map with this feature amongst others. And it shows us that it was clearly visible then. Um, another feature of the map that I don't have a slide for is up next to the house, there had been a service wing that we know was knocked down in 1905, but it is shown as being next to the house on this plan. So either it's because they were tracing it off the Ordnance Survey plan, or it's because this was drawn before 1905 and therefore still shows that, that particular building. But either way, we have an opening and sometime in the 20th century, somebody had some ashy burnt material to get rid of and a lot of brick from who knows what buildings that were brought into site to fill that hole. They aren't anything to do as far as I can tell with any of the buildings at Marble Hill, but obviously they were brought in from somewhere in the, in the wider area, um, just as landfill. Right, now I said it was discovered again in 1984, and here we have the team excavating it in a particularly grainy photograph, I'm afraid. Um, we can see, if we zoom in on the photograph, we'd see the, the pebble panels on the floor, which are quite nice. And some of the other photos we have from the series are quite good about that. Um, but essentially all they dug was the footprint of the grotto itself, the, the actual chamber, rather than the wider bowl that it sits in. Okay, and we know that they recorded, like I said earlier, uh, it's a shame we don't have the record that they did, but we have a photograph showing us creating that record. So it must be somewhere. And we're hoping against hope that we might eventually find it buried somewhere in the London archive. Uh, unfortunately, they're closed at the moment thanks to COVID. So it'll be a while before we can actually get a chance to, to see inside it. Um, right, and this is a photograph of the workers from the GLC building the walls that we see now, which are completely made up uh, in order to make a feature. And they've, they've dug out a bit of the grotto bowl, but they haven't touched the sides or bottom in any direction, which is why we still have some archeology span left for us to e examine, uh, which is very, very handy as far as we're concerned. Uh, unfortunately, uh, those walls are going to have to come down if we're going to reconstruct this to look like it should do. Uh, but that's something that we'll be dealing with over the winter, presumably. Um, right, so to summarize sort of what we now know about the grotto, and there will be a full report on this eventually uh, when I get the chance to, to actually write this up and synthesize it. Uh, but essentially we know that it was designed in the 1730s, probably heavily influenced by Alexander Pope, although we know uh, the first notion, uh, the first sort of noting of the grotto's existence in 1739, Lady Henrietta writes to a friend and says that she is positively up to her ears in shells. And that's, that's the earliest we know of the grotto existing. Um, we then know that the interior was modified. The rustication in places seems to have come down and those shell impressions on the walls seem to be a second phase of decoration. And then we have the big holes cut in the floor for those um, wells stroke soakaways, whatever they're doing. So there are several phases of activity over the years where the grotto goes from a place to have tea parties to a place that you maybe look in and, and hear water burbling away or whatever's going on, but not necessarily a place that you spend time in. Um, 
we know then that the chamber seems to have been buried by the late 19th century, but not infilled, just simply blocked up and then the area covered with soil. Uh, the rubble that we saw earlier on um, over the cobbles on the, on the outside of it seems to be the face of the earlier grotto simply pulled down and gotten rid of before it then gets back filled with more soil. Uh, but the bowl itself remains open into the 20th century, quite possibly even as, as late as World War II. We're not really sure. Um, and then of course re the chamber is rediscovered in 1941 and then rediscovered again in 1984 um, and then remodeled in the late 1980s. And hopefully at the end of this project, we'll have remodeled it again bring it back to the 1750s so that everyone can enjoy it. Right, so at this point, I'd like to give some thanks to the um, English Heritage staff and volunteers on site who've all really helped us bend over backwards to make this a really successful project and actually good fun to work on. Uh, as well, I mean, I'd extend thanks to the ground control people, the, the main contractors on site who've also been very kind to us. Um, and um, it's, it's been great fun. If you need to contact me about anything or if you want to ask questions outside of this, um, you can always drop me an email at thomas.cromwell at historicengland.org.uk, a name that doomed me to studying history. Um, and then I will hand over at this point to Rachel to talk to you about the English Heritage website. Thank you, Thomas. That was fascinating. And it has really been uh, such a delight to have you with us and the whole of your team um, bringing such expertise to Marble Hill uh, as we understand a bit more about the, the history and the heritage. Um, the, the very bottom um, link is just a, a link to where you can donate. Um, as we've now found out a little bit more about our history, we've now got the responsibility of being able to reconstruct it and um, interpret and share about it. So um, if you would like to help us do that, uh, please do um, donate there. Um, thank you so much, Thomas. It was really fascinating to hear um, about the, uh, the grotto. And I've got a few questions from the floor who've asked, um, uh, and I was just wondering whether you could pop back to the few slides back where it's got a bit about the floor, because I think that might help with the question. Uh... So uh, the question was around the knuckle bones. Ah, right. um, so, ah. and there they go. Yep. <laughs> So it was just um, in terms of how they would have got there and uh, which part of the animal do they come from and can you tell us a bit more and is this the yeah. uh, where are there are there other knuckle bone floors that we can see? Oh yes well um, starting with which bit of cattle they are um, they're cow bones and they're the sort of um, I think they're the sort of the knee joint effectively of the leg bones and the reason that they're used for this sort of thing, it, it's a popular thing in the 18th century, is that there are lots of them. If you think about the amount of butchery that goes on to create the meat that we eat, every one of those animals has a skeleton and we have to do something with it. Nowadays, of course, a lot of that would go off to be ground up to be fertilizer. Um, if you go back more than hundred odd years before they had the technology to grind it up to make fertilizer, you had to do something else with the bones. A lot of it was used to make things out of uh, bone handled um, utensils, et cetera. Anything we can think of now that we'd make in plastic, they had to make out of something else back then. And bone was a common material. So, you know, handles for cutlery, all sorts of things. Um, and as a result, there were plenty of these bones hanging around. And the, the bones that we see, they, they, they've only got sort of the, the bottom sort of six inches or so of the bone, sort of, you know, about yay long with the, the knobbly bit at the end, and then just a, a small bit to set it into the ground. And um, essentially they're using either cattle in this instance, or you get sheep or um, deer bones, depending on which estate you're on and what they happen to have lots of. Sometimes you get pig bones as well. Um, and we get them at places like at Rest Park, where in the bathhouse, there's a floor that's got sort of knuckle bones used as, as edging, like here to divide up panels. Um, they also had a root house at Rest Park, which we excavated 
Unfortunately, they had removed the building and its floor. And I think mainly so they could recycle, not so much the, the, the bones, but the actual pebbles, because Rest Park, kind of like Marble Hill, doesn't have any natural stone anywhere nearby. So all of those pebbles and things would have been a valuable resource. And I think they, they went from the root house to the floor of the bathhouse. Um, so it was a common sort of thing uh, for the upper classes to decorate garden buildings with this sort of um, yeah, material. It's incredibly hard wearing. And in more industrial settings, even in the sort of 16th, 17th centuries, in London, you find, and other large towns, where you've got lots of butchery going on because yeah, they have large populations that need to be fed. You'll find whole work floors made up of these bones set in that sort of way, simply because it is a really hard material and it, do, and it doesn't matter if it gets flooded occasionally or whatever. Uh, it's easy to clean, easy to maintain, and there's always an endless supply of the material. So if it gets damaged, you simply put more in. Fantastic. And the flints, um, they, they mm -hmm. look so beautiful uh, when you can see it from up high, just as your, um, this picture depicts. It really shows kind of the, um, uh, the decoration that would have been, been done. Well, this is it. She was going for all the color and, and interest that she could build into the structure. And of course, when it was new, it would have all been much cleaner and much shinier. The, the corals would have been brighter. The, the shells would have been interesting colors. It wouldn't have faded the way, you know, over time they, they'll bleach out. Um, so it would have been quite a vibrant sort of space that she was building for herself. And um, the flints themselves, I mean, they're coming from a long way away because there is no natural flint like that anywhere around here. So they're either coming from somewhere up in, say, Suffolk. You know, we, we famously, we have Grimes Graves where there's a, a seam of flint that was being quarried in, in sort of ancient times. Um, but basically it forms in chalky soils and it seems to form in pockets of, within the chalk. Um, the, I've heard various theories as to how it forms and what it's doing, but essentially it, it's filling a, a void, so like a cast and then solidifying. Um, and you get it basically wherever you get large chalk deposits. So again, if you go out to Wiltshire or down to the South Downs, you'll get this sort of stuff. So it's coming from some way away. And because it's big, heavy material, obviously, it's a bit of an expense to bring it in. So it's showing off your wealth that you're not building out of local material. You're building out of something you've had to truck in from, from quite a distance. Um, and the pebbles, I have no idea where they're coming from, because, again, we don't find pebbles of that sort of size anywhere around here. So, you know, once again, the, there's a builder's merchant somewhere in the 18th century who's obviously making a killing off this stuff. Plus all the coral that comes in mainly with ballast in, in ships doing, unfortunately, the triangle trade of you know, slavery and, and sugar, et cetera. Uh, and as part of the, the return voyage, in order to basically put enough weight in the hold to keep the ship upright, uh, in the Caribbean where natural rock isn't necessarily all that common, coral is. So they'd be bringing back coral instead, which is slightly lighter, you know, less dense. And then they'd have to get rid of it when they got here and could take on sort of new supplies and ballast, et cetera. Uh, and it, it does get dumped up and down the Thames, but it also finds its way into the hands of builders merchants who know that they're um, wealthy patrons who would like to have some. Uh, they're so beautiful, uh, beautifully colored and uh, mm -hmm. exotic. It would be a thing to, to show off um, your beautiful grotto with, wouldn't it? Exactly, exactly. There's a question from the, the team around um, the building adjacent to the grotto um, mm -hmm. of, you know, kind of the original uh, sort of glazed tiles or um, used as a toilet, potentially. Um, do the infill bricks relate to footings at all? Um, we don't know, <laughs> to, put it, to put it bluntly, because um, we originally had thought that it was actually attached to the grotto and was a chamber that you accessed through that back panel uh, where we had the recessed panels inside. Uh, but clearly that isn't the case. I mean, if I actually, if I go back a few slides, yeah, so the back wall there where we've got the wide arch and then we've got a sort of a rectangular recess. And we had hoped that was actually a doorway that had been blocked up, but it turns out not to be. Um, whatever that rectangular thing is around the back, it's been built up against the back of this 
probably at a later date and certainly with them knowing the grotto was there otherwise why would they build it against it kind of thing because it's not misaligned it, it it does look like it was stuck up against the side of it but it implies again that the grotto's got a new use because the floor of it is about two-thirds of the way up that recess so you couldn't get in from from the grotto into it um and if as i suspect it was acting as some sort of latrine you know the sort of thing you you would fill up and every once in a while someone would come and shovel it all out for you kind of thing if it was that sort of structure that the whole point is they're supposed to leak to get rid of all the liquids and if it's high up against the back wall of the grotto it's going to leak through the brickwork of the grotto which is a an unpleasantly interesting thought yes so so i i really don't understand the thinking behind why it's there and what it's doing but it, it does look and feel like a 19th century latrine with, and you'd then presumably have a building over it to actually use for the convenience. It, it seems rather odd given that the uh, grotto is talked about for its uh, floral fragrance and orange blossoms <laughs> and things in, in poetry. So um, who knows, who knows? But I think that's the joy of history. We're always trying to find out, um, which hmm. is uh, always a, a very exciting um, uh, opportunity. Mm. Um, one of the uh, uh, team also says about a glass factory um, that would have been relatively um, near to um, Little Marble Hill. Do you know any more about that and could that um, have been the source of the um, the glass? We, we have documentary hints that there is a glass house down there, um, round about sort of the area where the black walnut tree is now or somewhere near that. So down by the river. And obviously if there was a, a functioning glass house there, um, because they go through huge amounts of fuel in order to keep the furnace going to melt the glass and large amounts of sand, which they could have gotten from the site here and other materials, being near the river is a handy thing because you can bring in bulky stuff like your fuel up the river on a barge rather than having to carve it, which is a, a much more laborious and therefore expensive way of moving material. Um, we haven't had a chance to look for a glass house down there. There's obviously the black walnut tree might be in the way. Um, there's other landscape features that people probably don't want us digging up at the moment. Um, so at the moment, we only know that there's supposed to be a glass house down there. If there was, however, that's an obvious source for all the shiny bits of glass and furnace waste. And also there's, there's a lot of clinker sort of um, where you, um, where the pots and things sort of bubble over, you get sort of glass material that's infused with air bubbles, sort of like a sort of glass arrow, I suppose. Um, and um, yeah, there's large amounts of that that are gathered up and used in the walls and the ceilings to turn this into a, a, a cave rather than a, a brick room. So if there was one there, that would be a very handy source for it to get the material from. There certainly isn't one by the time anyone's drawing any maps of the area. So we're not really sure, but there would have been up and down the Thames anyway, other glass houses that were close enough, the local builders merchants would have gotten material from them. So do, you do we think a glass house is, um, it is a works, not a greenhouse? Yes, at that point where they're talking glass house, they're actually talking about a place where you manufacture glass. There are later glass houses that we know of on the site, including one that we accidentally dug up in 2017, um, which was shown, but not very clearly on the Ordnance Survey map, uh, the first Ordnance Survey, you know, first edition OS, um, which was more the, the glass house as we know it today, a, a greenhouse in which you grow plants. But back, back in the sort of 18th century, when they're talking glass houses, they're mainly talking about manufacturing sites. Great. Well, I, I hope that's cleared up all the uh, questions from um, the floor. And thank you to all those people who participated in those um, today. Um, Thomas, it's been lovely to have you with us. And um, mm -hmm. we will make sure that this is put onto the YouTube channel as soon as we can, um, so more people can enjoy it. But thank okay. you so much for being part of Marble Hills Revival and for sharing uh, uh, about this today. Um, and we really look forward to everything being um, open and available for everyone to have and explore. Um, I can't wait. <laughs> it's, it's done in the spring and the house is open for free. So. Mm. Um, but 
huge thanks for um, all your unearthing and for all the team's hard work. Um, and, uh, and thank you for tonight. Okay, it's been my pleasure. Take care, everyone. Good night. Okay. Bye.